In 2025, the United States Equestrian Federation announced that hair testing was going to be added to their drug testing protocol in response to rumors that horses were allegedly getting drugged with powerful sedatives. Why test a hair when they already had blood and urine testing well established? And if hair test is good for drug testing, why is it a complete waste of money when it comes to getting nutritional information? Let's dive in. I reviewed over 20 research papers on the subject and read a whole bunch of articles in order to summarize all this information here for you. Later on in the video, I will let you know where you can get the full list of those articles if you're interested, of course. Turns out, testing hair is not something new. We've been doing it since the 1850s. But what has changed, of course, is the method as well as the sensitivity of the instrument that are being used. We can now detect very small amount of substance pretty reliably thanks to mass spectrometers. So what can hair testing really tell us? I will review the drug testing aspect, the DNA testing, and the heavy metal and mineral testing that can be done on horse hair, and I'll touch on what they can and can't tell us about a horse's health. But first, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we need to understand a little bit more about hair grows to make sense of all of this that I'm going to talk about a bit later. So I will once more use my high-tech whiteboard to look at the anatomy of the hair this time. Okay, so here what we have is the basis for understanding the hair growth. So we have the skin epidermis, and basically it plunges down, it makes this little bulge inside that's called the papilla, and it comes back up here. Now within the papilla is where you're going to find some blood vessels that bring nutrient and energy and element to the cells that are all on the base here that are basically modified skin epidermis cell and they all specialize in making the three part of the hair. So the central part is called the medulla in red here. Then what we have is what is called the cortex which makes up for the majority of what we think of the hair. And then finally what we have in black here is the cuticle. Um, so the cuticle is basically this black layer here. So it's represented, it's pretty thin, it's much thinner than the others. So it'll just be like a, a black line here in my drawing. So the blood brings in all, as I said, the nutrient and the energy and these cells reproduce and they basically grow and that's what makes the hair grow. So the medulla will make what is called the central part of the hair which is made out of very large cells for the most part, very big structural cells. And in fact, sometimes the hair is even inter, like air pockets, like there's no cells in here. And then it just propagate that. So the, the medulla, depending on um, different condition, will have air pockets. So here we have cells, and then we have air pockets in the middle. Um, the cent this part here, the cortex generating cells will contain what we think of as uh, melanocyte. So melanocyte are cells that make pigment. So what we have here is the generation of the cortex cells that are all packed in like this. And of course, they contain pigment. That's what gives the color to the hair. The color is not in the medulla, it's in the cortex. So we have all these cells being generated, and of course, some of them are containing some pigment. And then finally, we have the cuticle here, which I'm erasing, but these are long, flat uh, cells. And what happens is, as they grow, they overlap, and they make kind of a, a shingle appearance to it. And that's why when you look at a hair under the microscope, you will see these shingle-like structure. So the part above the skin is called the hair shaft. And then at the base, we have the hair root. And we are familiar with those words. So there's an important distinction between the hair shaft and the hair root. And that's because as the cells move up, right, as they're being pushed up because there's other cells being generated, there's an interesting process called the keratinization that occur. And what happens here is that we start with what we would consider normal cells. They're alive, they have a nucleus. Uh, some of them might have some pigments, of course, in them. But what happens is as they mature, as they move up, 
as I say, being pushed by others, they slowly, they eject their organelles and eventually they eject their actual nucleus until there is basically nothing in. And the reason for that is that it starts to generate keratin. Keratin is a protein that slowly basically takes over the cell so that by the time the cell reaches the top of the skin epidermis, it is fully keratinized and it is fundamentally dead. So what we have here is at the base, the cells are alive. They're being generated by the specialized epidermis cell. And as they move up, they slowly get keratinized. It makes them a lot more solid, obviously. Kerat keratin is the same thing that makes our nail and that makes the hoof. So a very, a very uh, solid uh, protein. But by the time that it reached this point, the hair here is dead. So that's the, the basic of how hair are being formed at the base and then moving up and then slowly transforming until what is in the hair shaft, the part that is visible, is fully keratinized and basically just um, dead cells. So here's a fancier diagram that kind of shows you everything that I tried to show you on the whiteboard, but in a static image. So we can understand now why we can say that there is definitely a connection between the hair and the blood vessels, and therefore what is happening in the metabolism, you know, we can imagine how it could be represented and, uh, and stored into the hair cells. So, in a way, the hair records what was in the blood at the time of the formation of the cells. So the hair bears an imprint of the blood composition. That's the fundamental. Some would say it's a snapshot or a picture of that moment. Yeah, how nice would it be if it was, but no. It's actually a very poor quality photo, a kind of a photocopy, a bit of a distorted image, if you want, of what is really going on. You see, not all minerals and proteins get taken up by the hair cells at the same rate. Some compounds easily get into those cells, while others simply don't. It's not even constant from one horse to the other or for the same horse from one time of the year to the other. For some compound, it can depend on the color of the hair. Because you see, some protein binds to melamine. That's the pigment that gives the color to the hair, while others don't. The hormones circulating in the blood can also affect that profile. We know, for example, that pregnant mares can sometimes show a change in color as the hormone can impact how much melamine is produced. And if the product you're tacking is easily bound to melamine, well, you can see how the result would vary. The age of the horse also has an impact as young horses grow hair a little bit more quickly than older ones. So it's possible that the profile of two horses in the same condition, being exposed to the same diet and environment, can have some very different hair composition. However, what does not change is the genetic material contained in the nucleus of the cells. As we saw, when the hair grows, the cell expel their organelles and their nucleus as they get keratinized. That is why to get that DNA from the hair, you need to yank out the root bulb. That's the part they will be testing in the lab. The genetic information in those cells will not change with age or diet, and they do represent the genetic signature of the whole animal. So it's used for parentage confirmation, color testing, and to detect some genetic disease. If you're enjoying the content so far and you'd like to help me keep bringing you the latest in horse sciences, here are some of the ways that you can help the channel, and every little bit will help. Thank you. Knowing that what ends up in the dead part of the hair is only a pale or distorted representation of what circulates in the blood at that time, and knowing that some compound will be absorbed more than others into the hair, why is hair testing a good way to do drug detection? Well, it does and it doesn't. It comes down to what you're testing for. If, for example, you're looking for a drug that is allowed, but not within a few hours or days or weeks or whatever of competition, then the hair is probably not the way to go because you cannot pinpoint exactly when the drug was administered. However, if a compound is completely banned and in fact should never be administered to horse, such as barbiturate, then hair is perfect for this because it'll capture even traces of it and it doesn't matter when it was given. The presence in the hair proves that the horse was exposed to it and sanctions can be imposed. False positive are difficult to explain short of claiming sabotaging of the test.
This concept that something should never be in your horse in the first place is also the idea behind heavy metal testing of hair, which is what actually started this whole idea of using hair in humans as fur as a snapshot of what the organism is exposed to. You see, heavy metal, lead, cadmium, aluminum, and the likes can be present, but in very small amount. They're just not good for the organism. Therefore, if the hair is recording above just trace level at any point, then you know that the person or the horse has been exposed or is being exposed to some abnormal level. And it's important to find out the source and to limit the exposure as soon as possible, obviously. So for things that should never be in the organism to start with, hair analysis can be quite useful because of its long detection window. But what about the stuff that needs to be in the organism? What can hair tell us about mineral and vitamin levels? Can it spot deficiencies or imbalances? Can sending in hair to get some guidance as to how to adjust our horse nutrition be useful? When we talk about nutrition and mineral balance, we're really talking about a handful of elements. Um, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, copper, iron, manganese, magnesium, sodium, and chloride. And the concept of balancing mineral intake and nutrition comes from our understanding of how they're processed on average by the metabolism. It's, it's based on understanding of the chemical pathways that use those elements and how they can interfere with each other. And that is how nutritionists balance diet. They look at the ratio of various elements with each other as well as the total amount needed by the animal. I already explained that the hair is a poor reflection of what is actually circulating in the blood. So what can the blood tell us about mineral level and balance? The reality is in between it depends and not much. You see, blood chemistry is tightly controlled by the metabolism in a process called homeostasis. It's just a word to indicate that the body works really hard to keep the blood composition at optimal and stable levels. So for example, if your horse was to get a lot of salt one day, they would simply excrete it and you would not see any impact on the blood composition. When a horse is not able to maintain that equilibrium and that its blood gets out of whack, that's when your horse is sick. And for that reason, the blood doesn't necessarily reflect the diet intake of all minerals. For phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, Blood composition and concentration are actually linked to the uptake. And, of course, within the variability of blood tests, you can expect the blood to reflect those levels. For calcium, copper, zinc, selenium, iron, iodine, sodium, and chloride, blood levels are not a good indication of dietary intake. So if the blood is not a great indicator, and understanding that the hair is a poor reflection, or like I say, a distorted reflection of what's in the blood, now we can understand why hair is not the most reliable source of information when it comes to things being out of balance or outside of normal when it comes to minerals. Qualified nutritionists overwhelmingly agree that testing hair is pretty useless. So all those services selling hair analysis to help you balance your horse diet, and then conveniently also selling you the supplement that goes with the deficiency or the imbalance that they have detected, are probably a waste of money. So what is the gold standard to find out if your horse mineral and vitamin levels are good then? Well, it turns out it's a liver biopsy. Yeah, right. Not exactly easy to do. But because the liver filters the blood and plays such an important role in maintaining it within its narrow range or its homeostasis, like I was mentioning, this is where you look for any credible indication of profound or significant imbalance. Okay, you say, so why don't they do a study to compare liver values to hair value to see how out of whack the hair values are and maybe figure out a way that we can kind of reconciliate the two and use the hair information in a quantitative way? Yeah, well, they did that. The results were not good. They found little to no correlation between what the liver analysis, which as I repeat, is the gold standard, what the liver analysis was telling them, and what the hair had been witness to. If you want to see all those articles and those research paper that I use to get some clarity on this subject, then head over to my Patreon page. The link is here, and it will also be down in the video description. So where does that leave us? For nutrition, 
testing hair is pretty much a waste of money and just an opportunity for supplement peddlers to sell you their product. So steer clear of that. Invest instead in a good hay analysis and hire a reputable nutritionist. They will help you look at your horse, your horse's diet, and help you optimize it. I want to thank my Patreon supporter, Joan and Tam. Joining my Patreon her gives you access to my research note, like I said before, but also behind the scene video, polls on what topic I should cover next, and some other content. And of course, your support helps the channel get better and provide you with more in-depth, fact-based horse information. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, I'll see you on the next one.